Thank you, thank you. Hard to see hands, but let's do a little quiz here. Filtration was awesome. Great speech, by the way. Raise your hand if you do oil analysis for your job. That you use it in your work. I must say here, probably everybody should have their hands up, right? Okay, hands down. How many people here routinely do used oil analysis on your daily driver? Wow, even fewer than I thought. Like in this group, I'm thinking, hey, I might be surprised. It might be half the room. We had 80% of the room raise their hands the first time. I think I saw three just then. Why? Why don't we apply what we do in our jobs to make sure that everything, the assets that we're protecting and managing are working well? Why aren't we doing that for our daily drivers or our other fun toys? Could it be that we have a thing like an oil life indicator or do we have just practices that we've always done that we've had good luck with? So we haven't had any problems, so there's no motivation to do anything different. So with that thought process in mind, let's actually discuss a couple of things. How do those oil life indicators actually work? And is there a place? Does used oil analysis actually have a role in what I would consider the consumer automotive space? Obviously, we know that condition monitoring Filter performance, that's fantastic, right? Oil and filter side by side. It's like someone planned this out or something, right? So we know that condition monitoring, oil analysis is a very powerful tool for extending life, optimizing service intervals, which in the end saves us money. And the point I'm trying to make here to set this up, I know that a brand new truck right now a maxed out F-350 costs almost as much as what I paid my house for. You may be in the same situation. So our daily drivers aren't disposable cars anymore, although some manufacturers might be making them that way. The idea is that they're supposed to be long-term assets. Maybe we should treat them the same way. So let's get into something here just from a little history perspective, because it's always important to have a little bit of perspective. 163 years ago, oil was discovered. So the oil industry has been around for a long time, and we're still wondering, how often should we be changing our oil? Right? Should we do the old Jiffy Lube three months, 3,000 miles? Should you do it every six months? Does time really matter? Or should it be based on something like mileage? Or can we get a little bit better than that? Now, this question has been asked for a long time, and different manufacturers have different recommend recommendations for different reasons. But back in 1928, Kendall came out with the first 2,000-mile oil change interval oil. That's why there's two fingers on it. Now, the interesting thing about 1928 is that's almost 20 years before zinc dialkyl dithiophosphate, ZDDP, zinc as we might call it was invented. That's right. Back in the 20s and the 30s, motor oil was oil, refined base oil. There weren't any additives in it. And it could go 2,000 miles back then. And as a used oil analyst, do you know how many less than 2,000 mile oil drain interval samples I see per year? Way more than I should. Way more than I should. So, there's a lot of confusion here. There's a lot of opportunity for growth and saving money, being more efficient. I think we're probably in this room familiar with the term maintenance-induced failure. Why are we working on something when we shouldn't? It's not always the best practice just to change it. So, and I'm not the only person who thinks of this. So, oil life indicators, how do they work? This is really, literally one of my favorite stories to tell. If you happen to know who Shirley Schwartz, AAK Sister Sludge is, this is great. If you don't know who Sister Sludge is, get ready, this is a great story. 
So there was three engineers at General Motors back in the 1980s, Paul Harvath, Don Smolensky, and Shirley Schwartz. And they recognized the same thing we've just been talking about, that there's massive confusion when it comes to what's the proper oil change interval? What should you do? Should it be 3,000 miles? Should it be three months? What, what is it? Well, you know, as a tribologist, somebody that formulates oils, I can tell you this, an oil, be it an engine oil, gear oil, hydraulic fluid, whatever it is, it's going to do exactly what the formulator designed it to do unless two things act on it, heat and contamination. The rate of oxidation, the chemical degradation of everything, rust is oxidation of iron. So oxidation is the chemical degradation. The rate of oxidation increases, it basically doubles every 18 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius for our Canadian friends. So the hotter you run that piece of equipment, the shorter the life is gonna be. The next thing is contamination. As a formulator, again, the same base oil that we use to make, say, gas turbine oil is the same base oil that's also used in engine oil, same base oil that's used in transmission fluid. Yet, a gas turbine might run for tens of thousands of hours or hundreds of thousands of hours, where you may be lucky to get a few hundred hours out of your engine oil. Why is that? They're both hot, so it wasn't the first thing. It's the second thing, contamination. Fuel is the enemy of your oil. And that is exactly what Don Smolensky, Shirley Schwartz, Paul Harvath figured out. Now, a little fun story about the nickname Sister Sludge is because Shirley is from Green Bay, Wisconsin. And her famous saying, within the tribology community at least, is that she can make anyone's oil fail in less than 3,000 miles. All she had to do was put it in her grandmother's car, who also happened to live in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and she lived one mile from church and one mile from the market. So every morning she would get up, I mean, she would go to daily mass, and in the afternoon she would drive to the market. One mile each way in the middle of a Wisconsin winter. That was enough to destroy the oil. Why? Because the oil never got hot enough to evaporate out the water that was built up from contamination from combustion. Because I used to work for piston ring company, piston rings and your clearances in the engine are the widest when the engine is cold. So you get the most blow-by into the crankcase. Sludge builds up from water, from low temperature operation, thus the nickname Sister Sludge. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, these guys were pretty smart and they realized that when GM was developing the OnStar system, they actually started developing it in the 80s. They actually put it in vehicles. They put it in Cadillacs and Corvettes before consumers even knew it was there just to make sure it would work and figure out what was going on. The beautiful thing about having OnStar in these vehicles is it gave them access to engine data. They could track those vehicles, they knew which ones they were, and they could actually pull data from the ECU. So they would know drive cycles, they could know engine temperatures, and they began to correlate engine operating conditions to the used oil samples they were taking from these vehicles. They would track certain VIN numbers and say, when that VIN shows up at the dealership, take a sample of the oil, send it back to us in Michigan, we're gonna analyze it. And they spent years developing a very intelligent algorithm that can actually tell you when to change your oil. And it uses a really simple system. Engine revolutions is the first one. Every time that engine turns, crankshaft rotates, the injectors fire. So, back to what I said before, two things, heat and fuel, contamination. So the thing with contamination is really simple. 
there's a the thing called the fuel to oil ratio. Essentially, the more fuel you put through the engine, the shorter the life of the oil is going to be. So they knew that. So we could count this. But they were really smart and said, you know what? Not every engine revolution counts the same. Back to Shirley's grandmother. That short trip driving in cold coolant temperatures is a bigger debit than normal operating temperatures. But if the engine gets really, really hot, we're also going to have a bigger debit. So every time it turns over, shortens the oil life. Really cold, limits it a lot. Really, really hot, limits it a lot. But just to give you some safeguards, let's just say, hey, if the uh, engine temperature reaches over 260 F on the water temperature, because they're not measuring oil temperature, they're calculating that, we'll just go to zero. Because if you overheated your engine, you probably need to bring it in. <laughs> Don't keep driving it, because something else probably bad happened. Or let's just say we're going to call it a year or 7,000 miles. We'll put some limits, some guardrails up just to keep people from being stupid. But we at least have an intelligent algorithm that will give you some data-based decision-making. Now, how accurate is it? So here's a sample from a, couple, from a vehicle where you just kind of picked randomly and checked it out. So it's a GM Dexos Gen 1 5W30. Viscosity is right and great at 9.4 centistokes. Oxidation is 13.2. It's barely even oxidized, right? It's not even close to a condemning limit. All the wear metals are fine. We have no, really no contamination. Silicon's right at 21. It's a little bit, but not bad. Um, especially for a car out west. This, is, this was taken in California with a car with Utah tag. So it's seen a lot of desert driving. So a little bit of 21, that's to be expected. Added to package, everything there is right in line with the Dexos 1 Gen 2 oil. All the wear metals, single digit, it's nothing. Looks really good. So, oh, there's the answer. I don't need to do oil analysis on my vehicles. The oil life indicator is going to tell me what they do. We're good. Uh, the only problem with that is it's not checking for fuel dilution. What if you have a dirty injector? That happens, right? If you have something else going on, what's happening? So without oil analysis, you can't see something like, oh, we have excess silicon. Maybe that air filter was bad. We have high fuel dilution, so it's just lowering the viscosity. That's increasing the wear. Because dirty fuel injectors are actually a real problem. As an oil analyst, it looks at, looks at we'll call it, that consumer automotive space oil analysis, this is the biggest thing we see. People use bad fuel, they use dirty fuel. When it comes to diesel, you may or may not know this, the filter, filter thing, the ISO cleanliness standard for ASTM, compared to what the injector needs to see in a modern engine, is a thousand times too dirty. So you could have up to a million particles in the fuel at a retail dispenser. And you have to get that down to less than 30,000. It's common to see up to 3 million particles per liter. 3 million particles per liter in the fuel at a retail dispenser and your filtration system on that vehicle has to get that down below 30,000 to keep the injector from being destroyed. Sometimes you may find fuel that's in the 17,000 range. That could be good. You may find it higher. You can find it even lower in some cases, but the reality is fuel cleanliness varies widely, especially when you go off-road and you're using bulk storage fuel. Are you, do you have proper filtration on the system to keep it from getting atmospheric dust in, in the system that could cause damage. Dirty fuel injectors are a problem because if you don't atomize the fuel, what doesn't it do? Burn. We only burn vapor. We don't burn liquid. The job of the injector is to atomize the fuel, to make it very small so that it's easily burnt. So if we have dirt damaged injectors, or if we have dirty injectors, guess what's going to happen? We're going to have higher fuel dilution, and higher fuel dilution equals higher wear, which is shorter engine life, less reliability, less durability, 
broke down on the side of the road. No one wants to be that guy. Now, fortunately, we do have some tools. The guys at Caterpillar uh, were nice enough to share this with me. So here's some just different diesels, fuel injectors. And we can see that there's a lot of deposits without any cleaner because in the U.S., standard number two diesel does not contain detergents. So it's pretty easy to get big de detergent buildup or big deposit buildup, the lack of that. Using a fuel detergent can make that injector much cleaner. Cleaner injector is going to do a better job of atomizing the fuel. So you're going to have less fuel dilution. Everything's going to be a lot better for you that way. And we can see the results. Here we were before. Over time, we've built up. There were 2.56% fuel dilution on a gasoline engine. Used one bottle of Chevron Tecron, not an ad, just what they used. Dropped it to less 1%. Cleaned the injector up. So if you use the right tools, use dual analysis, you can get that extra level of insight into your engine, which helps you protect your asset, which is what we're all here about, isn't it? And we've kind of established it before. Cars and trucks today are way more expensive than they used to be. So maybe we should start thinking about applying the same tools and wisdom we use in our real jobs to our daily drivers. Thank you all so much for coming. Appreciate it.